Coming up on this episode of Nintendo Cartridge Society. Check your insurance. Your primary care physician is retiring on November 1st. And it's Dr. Mario. It's dangerous to go alone. So the Nintendo Cartridge Society goes with you. Welcome to Nintendo Cartridge Society. My name is Patrick Ellers, and I am joined as I am always joined by my co-host, Mark Mitchell. We've got a good show for you today. We are going to be talking about the news from the week, including new updates to new Pokemon Snap and Animal Crossing. And then on Thursday, we are marking 10,000 days without a new entry in the Star Tropics franchise with a mega ranking of things from Star Tropics. But Mark, in the meantime, how you doing? I'm I'm doing great. I can't believe that it's been ten thousand days. Ten thousand days since the last. I'm just imagining the world's biggest Star Tropics fan, who may or may may not be Patrick Ellers, and like what, just an, what <laughs> just an etch in the wall for mm-hmm. every day that a new Star Tropics game has not been announced. I mean, this is an important day that we all uh, should have acknowledged. But I should have prepared everyone that it was coming up. It was uh, it was July thirty first. Uh, so over the weekend, we had to celebrate isn't right we had to uh honor and recognize the 10,000th day in a row without the release of the new <laughs> star tropics game <laughs> um yeah uh so yes we we will be celebrating that game uh in or we will be celebrating the first one not the second one which was released 10,000 days ago 10,002 days ago um on Thursday uh but mark right now we're telling you about the Sonic Forces borrowing program. Uh, you can borrow my copy of Sonic Forces for the Nintendo Switch if you want. All you gotta do is email us at Nintendo Cartridge Society at, at gmail.com. gmail.com and give us a mailing address, or we can send you again my copy of Sonic Forces uh, for the Nintendo Switch. You play it for as long as you want. You send it back; it doesn't cost you anything. There may be a copy of Untitled Goose Game in there. There's nothing we can do about that. Sometimes the goose is just in the box, and that's what you have to play instead of Sonic. Yep. The other thing you can do is you can leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. We appreciate it a ton. It helps people find the show. It helps the show grow. If you leave us a five-star review on the U.S. Apple Podcast Store, we will give you a shout out on the show. If you leave a review anywhere else or you favorite it or do whatever you can do to promote the show, and it is outside of the U.S. Apple Podcast Store, Send us a email, send us a Twitter DM, let us know, and we would love to give you a shout out on the show. We really appreciate it. Yeah, we we really do appreciate it. Thank you to everyone who has done it so far. Um, and no no shade or shame or any on towards anyone that hasn't reviewed yet. But you know, like, what are you waiting for? Like, right? (laughs) Um, Mark, before we get into uh the news and all that stuff this week, um, we've got a debug from a previous episode. Um, a couple weeks ago, we were talking about modernizing the Zelda games, and we got a debug from Super Game Joy at Super Game Joy on Twitter. Uh, and the debug reads um, Debug for this app. The original Japanese release for Zelda did not require a password for saves. It was originally released on the disk system, which, would, which used read write functionality for saves, as it did with Kid Icarus and Metroid. Zelda was later re released on Famicom with battery save. That is, of course, right. I said that in Japan it was originally a, uh, a a password save feature, which is actually what they used in the states for a couple of games because they didn't they weren't using the Famicom disk system uh, in in the U.S. So uh, I I did have um, some some details messed up there at Super Game Joy, uh, keeping us honest, keeping us in check. Uh, we do appreciate it. So uh, thank you for that. Um, Mark, we also have an email from Alana. Um, It's a good long email, Alana. Thank you for uh, writing in. Um, It was an interesting read, and I'm going to share the rest of it with uh, Mark um, later. But uh, some interesting questions here just sort of uh, that that I wanted to read from the email. Uh, She writes, Hi, Patrick and Mark. I have spent the last couple of months uh, diving into a rabbit hole, diving into the rabbit hole that is Nintendo ROM hacks, mainly due to wonderful streamers and YouTubers such as Simple Flips and Snoop Lax. I've been listening to your show for years now, and I can't really recall any mention of, of the Nintendo ROM hack community, and I think it might be time to change that. If you're not familiar with ROM hacks, they are essentially fan, 
uh, fan games made using original game e- using the original game engines. By far, the most popular game to create ROM hacks for is Super Mario 64. It also seems that uh, that uh, Nintendo 64. Uh, te- uh, sorry. It also seems that Nintendo 64 tends to get the lion's share of ROM hacks, though they exist for practically every every classic system. It's absolutely incredible what ROM hackers are are able to create nowadays, especially with Super Mario 64. For example, I recently watched a playthrough of a hack that added Odyssey's move set, Cappy, and uh, capture abilities to the game. Uh, and uh, Alana goes on to uh, mention a, a bunch of other different uh, ROM hacks and the sort of uh, features that they bring. Uh, to the community that uh, engages with them. Um, Mark, generally speaking, I would say we don't bring up ROM hacks on this show because there's like a gray to just dark area of uh, legality where it comes to uh, playing them, right? Yeah, I mean, honestly, part a lot of it for me is just ignorance. Like the only sure. ROM hack that I really have ever seen run, or at least know that I'm watching is like the Kaizo Mario Brothers 3 ROM hack that sure. um, was featured in some games done quick speedruns in previous years. That I, I, uh, It's really cool for me to hear that Mario 64 is like the go-to hacked game um, because I totally expected it would be Mario Brothers 3. But again, that's because that's like my very limited glimpse into ROM hacks. Um, it's almost like the Super Mario Brothers 3 one is like, Mario Maker before Mario Maker existed, right? Yeah, totally. Like, uh, they use the assets from Super Mario Brothers three, and then occasionally throw in something from like, uh, Super Mario Brothers two USA or the original Super Mario Brothers, and just create these like absolutely wild, like just demented levels that are incredibly difficult but really fun to watch. That sounds awesome. That somebody put like the Odyssey yeah. move set into Mario sixty four. Uh, it kind of makes me want to check it out a little bit more. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I know we've talked a little bit about uh, when it comes to like uh, GDQ or, you know, other um, uh, events like that. We've talked about like the Super Metroid randomizer or like the Link to the Past randomizer, which like puts it just shuffles where all the items are. All the treasure chests become uh, kind of moved around and you have to approach the game totally differently depending on what items you uh, encounter when. Uh, and that there's also a uh, Link to the Past, uh, Link to the Past Super Metroid, like mashup randomizer that like you're playing both games at once and you get items for one game and the other um and so like there there certainly are uh, a handful of rom hacks that you and i are sort of tangentially related to um but i guess i i, I guess i i suppose i i don't actually know what the um like how they're obviously not sanctioned by nintendo and it's uh using their assets without their permission um which I don't know. I guess uh, I, 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 I don't really know where I land on that. Just, you know, a lot of these games have been around so long that it's just fun to see people experimenting with them. Um, so I don't really know that I have like a an ethical objection to it. I just wonder about like what what is what is actually legal in these situations? Yeah, that's a good question. I have no idea what the legality is. But to me, it, it seems almost like a, uh, you know, like a um, fan hack where you would be putting, yeah, totally. you know, like a fan translation or something like that where I don't think the people who are doing this are like selling it or trying to get rich off of it. It's just for love of these games, which I think, right. um, I think is really cool. Yeah. Uh, and you know, uh, Alana calls out, uh, hold on. I want to find the, the, the partner email here that, uh, I, I, I liked quite a bit. Um, she says, although I am still new to ROM hacks, their seemingly limitless potential excites and inspires me. I wanted to share my sh- thoughts with the two of you because I think you could feel the same. You're both consistently coming up with great ideas that riff on Nintendo's established works, and I think you would enjoy ROM hacks for that reason alone. I was also thinking that because there's so much fresh content in regard to hacks, you two could find some great ways to incorporate them into your episode ideas. Um, which is uh, a good point. Look, uh, Mark, we've talked about a lot of things on this show, um, and you know we keep going like, hey, did we rank Koopas already? <laughs> <laughs> Look, we are always looking for content. So yeah. this this seems like a good avenue that we could start exploring. Yeah. So th- thanks for the nudge, Alana. I think we probably are going to start uh, looking into uh, some of this, uh, and you know, just kind of keep our eyes peeled. If you have other um, specific recs, I know you have some in that uh, email. Um, shoot them our way, Nintendo Cartridge Society at, at gmail.com. gmail.com. And that goes for anyone, not just Alana. Um, if you have uh, cool ROM hacks that you think we would be into, 
um, you know, let us know. Uh, all right, Mark, are you ready to get into what we've been playing this week? Yeah, let's do it. So I have been uh, playing The Legend of Zelda, The Skyward Sword, which I continue to take at a uh, leisurely pace, a slothful pace. <laughs> I am playing this game nice and slow. Um, since last we spoke, I finished the Forest Temple. Um, like I, I, I was, I had not been able to uh, defeat uh, Girahim in the sword fight uh, one on one. Um, but on my second try, I like roasted him, like just destroyed him. <laughs> um, I, I don't. There's, some, there's something about the way the motion control combat works, where like when I'm feeling it, I just feel it, and it like I'm good at it, and it's fun and exciting. And then sometimes when like I'm not feeling it and I get grumpy about it. Um, and my last couple sessions with the game, I've been feeling it. So I don't know if I just like broke past the wall of being grumpy about it uh, or what, but like I'm really, really loving the combat now. That's nice. I, you know, I um, uh, didn't have an opportunity to play Skyward Sword this week and I am a little bit nervous when I get back into it, which I'm going <laughs> yeah. to. Uh, just like I think. That with the motion controls and just remembering, like, yeah. you know, how you do the that uh, attack when the enemy's, like, down on the ground, right? Like, doing, like, all that kind of stuff. Um, I, I do wonder if there is some sort of, like, rhythm and that the more you do it, the easier it is. But I'm going to be honest, like, the Girahim battle, I total I don't feel like I was doing it the way that it was intended. Like, I could not, for the life of me, figure out, like, well, when his hand is over here, which direction am I supposed to hit him from? Like, um, yeah, like I could not get that to trigger, but uh, it, it worked out. <laughs> well, and because there, there also are like, you know, if if you are getting frustrated with um, combat, you can a little bit just like keep slashing. Yeah, and keep you can. Walking with the shield until like until like it's done uh, and, you know, use potions and whatever. Because you know how in that bat in the gear he battled, like, uh, one of his phases, he'll, like, step back, and then a line of, like, five daggers or whatever yeah. will come at you in a certain angle, and so you're supposed to swipe your sword at the right time in that angle to get it. And it's like, when he's, I saw he was doing that, I just ran away, because I couldn't get the timing of it right, I couldn't get the, like, angle to trigger correctly, so it's just like, <laughs> whatever, I'm just not going to stand around and wait for it, I'm just going to run. Oh, geez, Mark. Uh, I did not put together that you're supposed to s slash him in, <laughs> in, in that direction. I just dodged out of the way and then took a swing at him every yeah. time. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, g going back up into the sky and like exploring the other islands in the sky around Skyloft, super fun and rewarding. Like I can't, I, I, I was not, exp I was sort of expecting Skyloft to be like its own like isolated um, hub world, you know, village which it is still, um, but there's so much more to explore in the sky and uh, like flying around on the loft wing uh, to find these things was super fun. I was really enjoying it. That was such a fun surprise. Like after you beat the forest temple, um, Faye like kind of, kind of directs you and be like, oh, hey, there's like something over here that you can go check out. That's the first time that you're like, oh, there are other islands here. And that really was like also such a fun surprise for me. Because I love Skyloft. Like, it's my favorite part yeah. of this game by far. But it is, the hub that you start in is fairly small, which makes sense as, like, the beginning village. And so the fact that there is more to it is very exciting. Yeah, and, like, the, the first place that you explore, like, off of Skyloft itself is a, a little island that has, like, a bar. Like, a, it's got, like, a pub on it. Um, and it's like, oh, yeah, the, uh, you know, the the... The guy who is at like the the training station like he he comes here and like he likes the pumpkin soup um and i don't know there was just something about like uh knowing that there's this interconnected world of like characters that know each other all up in the islands in the sky um just got me so super excited it felt like i was living in like a a, a breathing world um i also knocked the chandelier down which is great <laughs> um he makes you pay off uh your your debt by uh you know delivering pumpkin soup around um, so that's super fun. And then, uh, I went down to the, the Elden Volcano, um, which is, you know, where the, the, the second dungeon is. And I'm, I'm on the approach, uh, to that dungeon right now, collecting the like key items so I can get in the front door. Um, but it's, uh, what, one thing that really struck me about this, this part of the game is that you, you meet a like race of, um, you know, 
volcano creatures that are like moles, right? They're they're like mole men. Um, and I just appreciate how much this game does the like regular Zelda thing, but different. Um, like if this was another Zelda game, those would be Gorons, right? Um, and the uh the Kikwi uh th- things that you mend the forest would be uh, either Kokiri or Koroks or whatever. Um, it's it's neat how much this game is inventing its own new mythical creatures. Yeah, and you know, uh, with the last trailer for Breath of the Wild two, where we realize that a lot of it is going to take place seemingly in the sky, it it makes me kind of excited or hopeful at least that we'll get some of these Skyward Sword connections and we'll see some of these races that are introduced in Skyward Sword, like in Breath of the Wild. That would be fun to me. I like those little uh, uh, Kiwi things. I thought they were really yeah. cute. Yeah, they're, 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 they're really cute. Um, oh, no. Oh, I had a question. I had a question and now it's gone. Oh, no, not a question, just kind of an observation. Um, I think it's funny that we accept um, Koroks and uh, Gorons and the Zora now. Um, because they are so specifically Zelda, right? Like mm-hmm. they are not from the like regular, uh, like fantasy, um, like tropes, right? Like they're 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 not D and D creatures. They're not Tolkien creatures. Um, they're not from any recognizable mythology. Um, they're just like inventions, and they're just like holy Zelda. I think it's awesome. Yeah, that is really cool. I mean, I guess the closest that you get is like elves and. Yeah, like, like the Hylians. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But even they are not like the typical like high elf that, you know, I think of from uh, like Dungeons and Dragons or Forgotten Realms or something. So, yeah, that's a really good point because they feel they totally feel like of a piece of all of those, but yes. um, stand wholly unique to Zelda. Yep. Um, we, we got an email about Skyward Sword from Chariot Goblin. Chariot Goblin writes, uh, hey, Patrick and Mark. It's my first time playing through Skyward Sword. My first thought when playing Skyward Sword HD was Nintendo definitely likes to reuse technology. The freefall skydiving and sword combat is from Wii Sports Resort. Rolling a bomb is from from bowling in Wii Sports. Landing on a piece of a planet is from Mario Galaxy. And flying the loft wing is similar uh, technology to Mario Galaxy 2's uh, fluzzard flying level. It's also worth noting that Monolith Soft assisted on Skyward Sword. The semi-open world design is definitely Xenoblade 1 technology, uh, especially the wall textures. Skyward Sword may be the ultimate Wii game. I'm curious to hear your thoughts. Thanks and keep up the great work. Uh, Chariot Goblin, you nailed it. Uh, that's such a good set of observations that like everything that was like cool and new and novel about how you controlled games on the Wii, um, they just ported into a Zelda game. And I love this idea that, because Skyward Sword was i guess it wasn't the last um nintendo Such a like late. first party yeah. game but you know it it definitely had to have been like the last like big release and um yeah i i love this idea that skyward sword is like the culmination of the wii right it's like you got wii motion plus you got all these different elements from other games all put together in one kind of like last hurrah yeah, yeah, I, 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 I think it's, it's, it's a very cool um observation and and makes me, um, I, it's, it's, it's such a a cool way to think about the game and like its place in history, um, which also like complicates it coming out on like a new platform, um, but yeah, you know, just like we said on our uh, Zelda episodes, like they're so tied into the technology that's available at the time. Uh, and we just want to, we just want those games to exist in perpetuity forever. So <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how we reconcile that. Um, Mark, we also got uh, an email. This is not uh, Skyward Sword related. Uh, so we're, we're moving off of Skyward Sword. We'll come back to it, I'm sure, many times in the weeks to come. Um, an email from Matt in Edinburgh. He writes, um, uh, he, he's, he's asking about the game Eastward um, and linked us to uh, an IGN video of Eastward's gameplay and said, Eastward is an upcoming pixel art adventure published by Chucklefish. I've had this game on my radar for a while. After watching the video, I feel a bit disappointed. The artwork, the artwork looks gorgeous, and the music sounds awesome, but I can't help but feel like the gameplay looks a bit boring. What do you two think? Um, so we checked out this, uh, this IGN um, preview, and uh, the game is sort of a... It looks to me like it's got real 
um, Secret of Mana or Secret of Evermore like vibes to it. It's a top down, uh, sort of Zelda like, um, with maybe more like RPG elements to it. Um, uh, adventure that, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree with the assessment that like the gameplay looks kind of hacky slashy, kind of uh, shallow. Um, but the aesthetic is cool. Yeah, the aesthetic is really cool. I, I think this game was announced or revealed for Switch a few years ago, and it's, so it's been long in the works, is my memory anyways. And I follow one of the pixel artists who worked on Eastward um, on Twitter, and you know he's been teasing little animation loops and things, or sharing, yeah. I guess I should say, animation loops and things uh, over the years. And I agree, like, the game aesthetically, like, I think is really, really beautiful. Like, it's really fun. Um, and the music in the gameplay that they showed is pretty awesome and really varied. I, but I agree that like the gameplay loop doesn't seem that fun to like play. Um, it does seem like kind of like Secret of Mana. So, but, but that's the thing, right? Like maybe yeah. Secret of, like Secret of Mana, I think is fun to play, but if I was introduced to it just through a gameplay video, I might feel the same way. So because so much of it seems like a labor of love, I'm willing to give it the benefit of the doubt, even if the gameplay in the trailer itself, or I guess the game in the gameplay video itself didn't do anything for me. Uh, I And also, I've played worse games with worse aesthetics. Like, sometimes aesthetic is all it takes to get you through. Yeah, totally. Uh, well, I think there's also just something to... Because the, the, the gameplay looks, uh, or the combat looks a little on the slow side, right? Mm-hmm. It's not like, um, you know, just to compare it to the only game i guess my brain will default to is like it's not snappy like hades right um it's instead like very deliberate and kind of slow like secret of mana um but uh like there's if if that feels right if it feels right in in your hands in the controller um then i feel like all is forgiven right it it, and you may not be able to tell that um just by watching the the video of it so like I'm, I'm, I'm sort of with you on that, Matt. Uh, but I don't know. I, like the the aesthetics seem like they might be enough to kind of pull pull through. There's no release date for um Eastward yet. Um, so you know we'll we'll keep our eyes on it too. And uh, when like more impressions start coming out, uh, I wonder if that's maybe even one that we could try to get um our our own hands on before it comes out. So. Yeah, yeah, that'd be cool. Um, but yeah, I Matt, I completely agree with you. This was a game that I've really been looking forward to. And the this gameplay video definitely kind of like dampered my enthusiasm mm-hmm. for it a little bit, maybe to realistic levels. <laughs> hey, which is good. Let's all set our expectations down to realistic levels <laughs> for all things. Um, all right, uh, that's what we've been playing this week. Let's get into the new releases and what we might be playing next week. Patrick, I think August is going to be a bit of a dry month. Um, not... We live in Los Angeles, we and live... there's a drought. Yes, yeah. Not a lot going on this week. Um, I, the one that I wanted to call out is on Thursday, August 5th, Picross S Mega Drive and Master System Edition will be released. This was a game that was revealed last week after we recorded our news episode, um, but I think you brought it up on our Thursday episode. There is a yeah, demo do. available for it now if anybody wants to check it out. But Patrick, do you want to give a quick uh, summation of what the game is? Yeah, so it's Picross, but uh, all of the images that you're uncovering, instead of being like, uh, you know, an alfresco or like a vase or something, um, instead, you are uncovering classic sprites from Sega Genesis and Master Drive games. Uh, I guess may- maybe just Mega Drive? Oh, it doesn't matter. Uh, it's a classic Sega sprites. Um, is it, so, it, it's it, called Mega Drive and Master System Edition, but are those the same system? Great question. I'm not. I'm. I, I'm going to be honest. Not really sure when it comes to Sega stuff. <laughs> yeah, we're not great at Sega stuff. <laughs> um, but I mean, regardless, like you're going to see a Sonic sprite, you're going to see uh, Altered Beast sprites, you're going to see Golden Axe sprites. Like, I'm. I'm there. I'm in. It sounds. Uh, I'm. I'm a sucker for a a, pick, a good Picross game. Anyway. Um, especially one developed by uh, Jupiter, as this one is. Um, so yeah, I'm there. I'm absolutely there. It's such a good idea. Nintendo, steal this idea. Yeah, steal the idea. I want to be uncovering like little Mario's and Toads and stuff. Like, why? Why isn't this a thing? Why? Why? Why isn't it a huge thing? Yep. Yep. Um, there, there's there's another game on here I wanted to uh to shout out. Also coming out 
um, on the 5th, which is Thursday, um, is a game called IFO, which uh, was available also on the 3DS and possibly the Wii U, I'm not sure, um, that is uh, sort of like a fake um, Game & Watch game uh, where you it's like a, a shoot 'em up sort of like a, you're a spaceship uh, flying around avoiding things. Um, but it has the aesthetic of Game & Watch. So, like, you're, even the screen, the, like, made-up screen that you're watching it through has, like, little scuffs on it. Um, oh, that's fun. And, and it's all, like, monochromatic. And, you know, you can sort of, like, see the, like, ghost uh, of, like, the LCD that's, like, not totally faded away. Um, so it, it, it's a, it was a neat game on uh, 3DS. Uh, they're selling it for under $3. So um, if, if that's of interest to you, uh, it's at least worth the curiosity. Also, last week, Nintendo updated the SNES Switch Online service with three new games, but there were no NES games announced. However, Nintendo did add a new SP version of Super Mario Bros. 3 to the NES Switch Online, okay. where you start in World 8 and your inventory, like one, I think it's just one row of your inventory is filled with basically the, the different suits Mario can pick up during the game, um, including some of the rare ones like the... Uh, hammer bro suit um that 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 is a smart sp version uh and I, yeah that's that that's good i still wish these weren't uh didn't appear as like separate games in your library um but that's because i'm a, a library neurotic and now i gotta <laughs> go in and like reorganize my stuff um mark pop pop quiz you can't look it up what are the names of the three games that came to the SNES Switch Online? Oh, I don't week? know. I don't know. And uh, not only can't I look it up, but when I was writing these notes down, I was like, should I look it up? And then I was like, no. <laughs> I want to see if I can do it. I want to see okay, if I can do okay. it. Okay, uh, okay. So I think one of them is called Jelly Boy. Is that right? <laughs> I, that's, I think that's right. Okay. Uh, Claymates. Okay. Because it's not Clay Fighter. And then the... Third, I, I cannot remember the third one. <laughs> um, hold on, let me. Uh, <laughs> let I, I, I like I'm trying to figure out how can I search for this. I'm not going to. I'm just going to look in our show notes from last week. Yeah, um, the, the to... best course of action is just see what we said before. <laughs> yeah. Okay, here we go. Claymates, check, killed it. Yeah. Jelly Boy, check, killed it. Uh, this one, uh, I there was no way we were going to get it. Bomboozle. Ah, bamboozle! I remember I was saying that it sounds like a a, a low rent bomber man. Uh-huh. I should have gotten this. I should have gotten it. <laughs> um. All right. So those are the new releases. Mark, let's close this segment out. The closing of that segment brings us to a new segment, which is an old segment and a regular segment on our show. It is time for 433. In 1952, American composer John Cage wrote a piece called 433, wherein a performer or group of performers did not play their instruments for 4 minutes and 33 seconds. For the purposes of this show, our instruments are talking about Nintendo. So, for the duration of one performance of 433, Mark and I will talk about something not at all Nintendo-related, thus fulfilling the contract of the piece. Mark, we are using another suggestion from our 433 episode. This one provided to us by Dominic. Dominic wants to know, what is our quarantine best-watched list? Um... So, what did we watch during quarantine that we liked, I guess? What made us feel the least quarantine-y? Um, I don't know. Is, is there anything that jumps to mind for you immediately, Mark, is what's on your quarantine best watch list? Yeah. I mean, uh, truthfully, I consumed so much during quarantine. But what I was in the mood for uh, so much of last year was just, like, um, the fast food of TV. My husband yeah. and I watched so many reality shows the the thing that stands out to me that we got a huge kick out of is we have watched basically every season of amazing race and we loved it that like uh i had watched the amazing race uh back you know in like 2005 when it was on you know season like five or six and then had not watched it uh for many many years and now it's on season like 31 and so it was it's it's been a ton of fun to like go like watch all of them try to like play the game and be like okay if we were in this situation what would we do <laughs> it, it was kind of like it was a fun way yeah. to like see the world almost uh when it, you were in quarantine like it it was a little felt like a little bit of like normalcy so that that was that's probably like the mvp of quarantine for my husband and i 
uh, that's such a good pick and such a like thing to watch during quarantine. Like it, that it it's it's a balm in a very specific way. Um, I almost went like my first thought is almost an opposite thought where like the only reason I had like the time to uh watch this show was because of uh being like locked down and in 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 quarantine. I'm referring, of course, to Star Wars: The Clone Wars. Um, which I'm so glad now that I, uh, have that background, um, because the sort of shows that have spun off of it or like that are, uh, you know, made from like the same people, um, keep calling back to elements of the Clone Wars. And those are shows that I like a lot more. Late Clone Wars, I love The Bad Batch, I love Rebels, I love, uh, Mandalorian, I think is pretty good, um. And so I'm getting so much of the mythology callbacks to early Clone Wars um, that weren't always fun to watch, but now I'm so glad that I did. Yeah, it's really, uh, you know, I'm a huge Star Wars fan. I have made a number of attempts to watch the Clone Wars and have just had really difficulty getting traction through the first, like, episodes um, in different, like, configurations and forms. But one thing that is really interesting is that like the clone wars and Dave Filoni, who's what like the showrunner of the clone wars. Um, it has become such a nexus of star Wars yeah. now of like new star Wars that I do feel like, uh, without having watched it, like I haven't started the bad batch because it feels like it is all interconnected in a way that I'm on the outside of right now. Yeah. And like in, in like a bad, I think it's a bad way, right. That like, the Bad Batch is separated as part of this, like, this is part of animated Star Wars, and the cost of, like, entry for being a part of that is so high that, like, man, it's a, it's a real bummer, but I'm, I'm glad that I, uh, I'm glad that I did it, and a lot of times it was just me, like, having it on in the background while I did, like, other stuff, um, which I would totally recommend. It's the, the worst way to recommend a show, like, don't, <laughs> yeah, watch it, but don't pay attention to it, it's fine. Um, uh, yeah. Oh, ahead. I was just gonna say, yeah, because, like, when, like, Ahsoka Tano shows up in the Mandalorian season two, it's like, I know, I know of the character and I know that she is beloved, but I don't know like the specifics of her arc really. You know what I mean? Right. Yes. Uh, And, and there's going to be more stuff like that. Like uh, there is a character in bad batch that if we don't see in this uh, book of Boba Fett show um, this year, like is going to be it, but we, it's a totally blown opportunity if, if she doesn't show up. Um, So yeah, other things that I watched during uh, the, the quarantine, um, I, wa- I finally caught up on Succession, um, that I had seen no episodes of Succession, but uh, uh, watched it all during quarantine. Uh, and that show's great. It's very fun and funny to watch these horrible rich people uh, tear each other apart. Yeah, I've heard it's really good. There's a lot of like those shows that I need to catch up on. Um, but really, like it, so much of my life now has been like at the end of the day, or when I'm ready to watch something, I'm yeah. like... I want something that is not challenging at all. Like, I, you know, like, yeah. uh, and so that sort of just like disposable, like popcorn TV is, uh, was my quarantine life for sure. Yeah. We watched happy endings twice. So, uh, <laughs> that, uh, that's the applause. We were accompanied today by a juggling troupe at the, S- okay. Saristoniemi museum during the silence festival in Kitalia, Finland. All right, Mark, let's get into the news. New Pokemon Snap gets a new update today at 6 p.m. Pacific time that adds three new areas and 20 new Pokemon to the game. Um, it, it's all for free. It is The three areas are the secret side path, which ha- has both a day and night variation. The description is the Neo 1, which is the ship, shrinks to a tiny size when you explore this area, so the Pokemon you see will look gigantic. You can even hear their breathing and footsteps in this thrilling area. And you might spot new kinds of behavior from Pokemon you've seen before. Also, it looks like at one point you're riding on one of the Pokemon as it, like, uh, glides down from the trees. Too fun. Um, Mighty Wide River also has a day-night variation. Mighty Wind River is... Oh, Mighty Wide River is a nurturing water source that provides the whole of Belusivia. No, that, that's not right. It's, uh, it's fine. Belsolva, something like that, island with sustenance. 
You'll be conducting research as you ride down the river, so be on the lookout for rapids as you search for Pokemon and keep your camera ready so you don't miss capturing them in action. Belusilva. Is that right? I feel like I'm like I'm reading these letters, but it is constantly rearranging on me. Okay, so Belu Silva. Belu Silva. Belu Silva. Okay. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Uh, Baron Badlands. This one I can handle. Oh, actually, I'm looking up what's ahead, and maybe I can't. This You're one also great. has a day-night cycle. In this area, you'll research the Badlands of Voluca Island, where dry winds from the desert blow. This area has many peculiar figures, from geysers to poisonous, gas-spewing swamps. Pokemon may be hiding underground or in the rocky cliffs, so keep your eyes peeled for them while you're on your expedition. Uh, super cool to see a bunch of free content coming to new Pokemon Snap uh, like three months after its release, right? This game came out at the end of April. Um, so that's, that's pretty awesome. Um, I sort of suspect that this is it. Like, this is the, the free content that they uh, were planning. Slash, maybe some of this was supposed to be in the original release of the game. Um, I know some of the uh, Pokemon and areas featured in um, pre-release trailers are from these new areas. Um, so, you know, this may just be that they, they hit a date by cutting some content and then are finally delivering on that content now. Um, but whatever the case, the game was uh, big enough and fully featured enough at launch that uh, this just feels like extra. And there's something about this, um, I, I didn't buy new Pokemon Snap, I haven't played it, but there's something about this secret side path where it like shrinks you down and there's giant Pokemon I know. that I am like super into. It makes me want to watch like playthroughs of it because I think that's really the enjoyment that I would get from Pokemon Snap is just kind of like being able to see the world, like the actual like taking photos and trying to get that scored. Um, I don't think I would enjoy that much, but just having it almost in screensaver mode is uh, kind of what I want. I mean, that's the joy of playing the game at all is that it, yeah, you're just, you're seeing the world and like discovering Pokemon doing funny things um, like, you know, fighting with each other, or eating a fruit or just like smiling at the camera. Um, like the, the game is wholly experiential, right? Like you're not, um, I know you are accomplishing something, but like, who cares? Uh, the points, <laughs> who cares? Like, I just want to see some cute stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, recently, there have been there's been talk of new updates for Animal Crossing New Horizons, and the game has been getting like some updates. There was an update recently that there were that added like uh like fireworks to the game, or well, right? it's 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 sort of just re uh inserting the fireworks from last summer. Got it. Um, it's sort of just uh you know re redoing that uh, event cycle, but with a couple um new unique items that you can buy in the store. And, you know, like, uh, in interviews surrounding E3, Nintendo of America president Doug Bowser mentioned that some new content would be coming, or that updates would be continuing. Um, and then with the release of this latest game update that uh, reinstated or brought back the, like, Firework Festival from last year, um, Nintendo again reiterated that more updates are coming. And so it, it has fans wondering, like, what features from previous games that haven't made it over to uh, New Horizons might make an appearance on their island soon, and new data mining from AnimalCrossingWorld.com has led to some speculation that the return of Brewster's Cafe could be in the works. And this is a, a I, I would say, much requested feature that yeah. has not shown up in Animal Crossing yet. It is almost exactly what it sounds like. It is a cute little cafe where um, you can go and have coffee, and Brewster is like this bird who um is the barista in other games this is where kk slider would come perform uh so it could be really fun to see it there there's um oh sorry go ahead patrick oh uh, just that uh it's i i I was going to move into like sort of the analysis here um that for me it feels like too little too or not not too little but just way too late um Animal Crossing isn't so much like a game that you play so much as it is like a way of life for the time that you're engaging with it, right? Um, that it's something that you check in on every day or a couple times a week. Um, and when you fall out of that rhythm, uh, it's just not like compelling to revisit, right? Um, 
I, I, I liked the game a lot. There was a long time where I was playing it with Sarah and, uh, you know, that we would talk, we would talk about our animal neighbors and stuff. And we've fallen so far out of that now that uh, I think adding another feature or, uh, a, you know, a, a one building or something isn't really going to be enough to uh, pull me back. Like, you know, it's it's not a completionist kind of game, right? Some of the uh, some of the categories of things are like way too varied or way too big that like you're never going to get it all anyway. Um, so yeah, I don't. Uh, this this just feels like uh, too too late for me. Yeah, I, I I think that's fair. I mean, I I play I stopped playing Animal Crossing New Horizons a while ago. I felt like I really enjoyed my experience with the game and mm-hmm. you know got my money's worth. Um, I. Yeah, that that's an interesting point. I feel like they sold so many copies of this game that, yeah. you know, even if it doesn't bring everybody back, bring, re-engaging some people would still be a lot of people. And I, it also feels like it is completely ripe for a Welcome Amiibo type big um, content update like we saw with New Leaf many years after Animal Crossing New Leaf was released. And so, uh, yeah, it, it, there's been speculation and it kind of feels this way that it's possible that COVID really messed with whatever post-release sure. plans, you know, they had for it. For such a huge audience, I do think that, you know, like the updates that we've seen in the second year have been a little bit disappointing, but nothing that would like bring me back into it, but like a big, you know, like Welcome Amiibo or like a substantial update like that. I, I think would draw a lot of people back in. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, I, I absolutely agree with that. You know, it's it's something that we've talked about with, like, um, Super Mario Kart, or Mario Kart 8 Deluxe, um, that, like, that game has sold so many times on Switch that it's practically its own platform right now, right? So releasing either free or paid content for either of these games, uh, that there is such a big audience that is, like, already engaged with it um that it it seems like leaving uh money or attention on the table um to to not add to both of these uh sort of in whatever way they can i sort of get that like 8 deluxe is like a done product it's the deluxe right it's we we're not uh changing that at all but like animal crossing could be like a living breathing ever changing thing uh and it just uh ha- it isn't or hasn't been i also think that I, I, like I'm by no means an expert on the internal structure of Nintendo. And so yeah. I don't have any clue how many people are working on animal crossing content compared to how many people have moved on to Splatoon three, I think is the same team that does like both. That would make sense. And yeah. so like, I, I think there is a totally a world where animal crossing new horizons, right? Like has a team dedicated to it. And all they're doing is like maintaining it as a live platform. Like I feel like that's what happens with a lot of, uh mmos is you have like a team that they're tasked with they like build it and then another team eventually steps up and they're the ones that are creating like new content for it all the time and um i just don't know that nintendo has like the or that they choose to use their resources in that way where they're like right you are just the animal crossing new horizons team and you will forever be creating new content for animal crossing new horizons yeah well and they're also like not really set up for that you know i i mentioned that it's like leaving money on the table not like charging for that content but that's also just like not the uh, economics of that game right that you sell the game once and that's it that's the you never you're never asked to pay anymore and i think that is part of what makes it uh, a game that you know parents are comfortable letting their kids play for you know however you know there's there's no um there's no danger to playing animal crossing yeah you know and it's weird because the mobile like that version of animal crossing does exist yeah, true yeah. In Pocket Camp on mobile phone. But it's just interesting to me that Pocket Camp seems to be doing fine, right? It like yeah. is chugging along, it has new content updates. Um, when Nintendo reveals like every quarter or whatever how their mobile games are doing, Animal Crossing is doing totally fine. It's not like Dr. Mario World, which is getting its plug pulled. But it it seems like in some ways I'm surprised that Pocket Camp is not like a bigger hit. Because it seems like, you know, it's yeah. free to play. We saw how huge Animal Crossing w- got on Switch. And so there is just something about these, like, Nintendo properties that outside of Fire Emblem Heroes and, you know, Mario Kart Tour is doing fine. But it's like, uh, 
that's not how people want to engage with them. Like, it just seems yeah. like, you know, like, uh, more people chose to engage with Animal Crossing New Horizons by buying the $60 version on Switch rather than the free version that you can play on your phone. Because that, like, live version does exist. Yeah, yeah, wow, that that is uh, that is sort of mind-blowing to think about. I, I mean, I, I think there is something to just being like, okay, now the game is not going to bug me anymore, right? Like, I'm just going to, which, especially for Animal Crossing, is such a... Um, you know, the game is just about like settling into a groove and making your own fun and all that stuff. And if you uh, are running up against like the artificial constraints that want you to spend money on premium currency to whatever, um, you know, you start to be stressed out by the actual economy and not the economy inside the game. Um, so I, I wonder, I wonder if it is like truly a psychological thing that like tying it to real dollars um, makes it less fun than just playing with bells. Yeah, and it's like, well, you're doing, like, in Animal Crossing, you're doing a lot of tasks for, like, other, like, neighbors and villagers and stuff like that, but maybe it's, like, when it's internally motivated, it's more fun than when Mm -hmm. you're doing it because that's, like, the, uh, that's the only way that you can, like, I don't know, you know, like, get the, craft the item you want to craft is because you have to, like, do, you have to do these three things for this villager. Would still be great to see them, like, uh, just fully support uh, Animal Crossing uh, uh, in an ongoing way. Like, even even down to just, like, quality of life improvements. Yeah. I, I, I love the game, but there are, you know, a bunch of uh, improvements that could be made to just make the game a little bit snappier and a little bit less, like, you know, plowing your way through the same dialogue boxes over and over again. But I got to tell you, Patrick, New Horizons is a vast, enormously vast improvement on uh, yeah. previous entries. But yeah, and you know, like maybe they've been quiet because they are working on like a really big like update for it. Maybe that's just not in the cards anymore. Oh, I should okay. The reason uh Brewster's Cafe is broken out specifically is because yeah. in uh the latest update, there's a new string of code that I'm not going to read because it's um like it's it's a string of code. But the key part in it is Talk Progress Museum Built Cafe, like one word. And uh, Animal Crossing World speculates that it could potentially, quote, be used to affect some dialogue with villagers or special characters on your island after the museum has been expanded to build the cafe. Of course, this is all speculation. Maybe it was something, maybe it's an abandoned feature. Maybe it's a callback to um, uh, the Wii U, right? The Project Cafe, wasn't that the code name for it? (laughs) Sure, yeah, there you go. You're nailing it. So, um, but fun to speculate, fun to speculate. Mm -hmm. Over three years ago, the NVIDIA Shield gaming device, which is kind of like NVIDIA released this Switch-like handheld device um, many years ago. I don't even know how many at this point, but like it feels like it was around the Wii U era. Basically like a similar proposition to what uh, the Switch is, what to the, the new... Um, valve devices but it never really took off here but they've been selling it in china and as part of you know like nvidia is the chip developer for nintendo for the switch and so apparently as part of their agreement nintendo uh, or nvidia or somebody was allowed to port some wii nintendo first party games for the nvidia shield in china exclusively so not only did they port them to the shield but they were upscaled to HD. So you could play these Wii games in HD on the NVIDIA Shield, including Mario Galaxy, Punch-Out!, The Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess, and Donkey Kong Country Returns. Now, uh, sorry, just to jump in here a second. And these are all also with button controls, right? Yeah, they must be. They must be, yeah. Yep. I Man, I would kill for an uh, on-TV... Uh, button controls version of Donkey Kong Country Returns. Totally. Oh my gosh, yeah, I didn't even think about that. Um, But apparently this experiment is coming to an end. According to reports on Twitter, the ability to purchase these games has been disabled. You can still re-download them if you bought them. But uh, whatever agreement they have or whatever, like, um, yeah, whatever experiment they were running no longer happens. Just one of those, like, weird... Yeah, flash side parts of history. Yeah. yeah. Um, Mark, uh, go on the record now. Do you think this is happening because all these games are coming to Switch? 
No, I think I think this is happening because all these games. Oh, actually, no, I don't. But but <laughs> I, I I do wonder if it was just like a timed thing where it was like just we'll like do it for three years. I don't know if the Nvidia Shield is like caught on in China. I don't know if you know like yeah. Um, especially now that Nintendo has an official presence there or with Tencent in and is selling the Nintendo Switch like officially. I, it seems like that's their what they see is their path forward in china not like a, a collaboration like this yeah but also if the work is already done like let's bring them let's bring them over to switch <laughs> do you do you i wonder i i have no idea who ported who ported these games yeah but i wondered like mario galaxy right like we got a version of it on uh super yeah mario sure 3d all-stars that had like a button control version and so i wonder like and it was in 1080p, so I I do wonder if um uh there was some you know like uh, cross pollination there. I mean, come on, put them on, put them on the switch, charge twenty bucks a pop, <laughs> and like clean up. Come on, yeah, seriously, seriously. <laughs> Outer Wilds, the highly acclaimed indie game, indie game from Mobius Digital and published by Annapurna Interactive, was announced for Switch earlier this year. Um, and although it was originally planned for a summer release, last week the companies announced the game has been pushed back uh, to the holiday season this year. Additionally, they announced a new Echoes of the Eye expansion, but for other platforms. There's no word yet on if the Switch will eventually get the DLC as well. well that's interesting. Well, uh, Outer Wilds, there was also a, a sequel to that announced, right? I make this mistake no. all the time. The Outer Wilds Outer is like, Worlds. yes, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. The Outer Worlds is the Obsidian uh, RPG that at Xbox's show E3 showcase, they did announce a sequel that will be exclusive to Xbox and PC. This is like the indie game where it's like a time loop. And every time you do it, yeah. like there's like more of the mystery you uncover. I actually think my confusion was that uh, I was thinking of the Switch announcement of the Outer Wilds as oh, like... Oh, uh-huh the announcement of a sequel so i think i mean regardless i was wrong <laughs> <laughs> bandai namco revealed that pac-man 99 has been downloaded over four million times and uh they also revealed the new dlc will be coming to the game i forget that uh pac-man 99 exists and i liked pac-man 99 when i was playing it yeah let's play pac-man 99 again yeah it it uh i Maybe they maybe they do do them, and I'm just not like uh, tapped into it. But I wish do that. I wish I guess like I was Tetris more Maximus. aware, yeah. yeah, of these like Tetris Maximus things. Uh, yeah, I I have not been aware of them doing any like kind of tournaments for it. And usually, like if I turn on my Switch over the weekend and there is a Tetris Maximus Cup, like there's some sort of news item that alerts me to that that happening. Um, but yeah, I I also haven't noticed that for uh, Pac Man ninety nine. Remember uh, when Pac-Man came out that we were all like, they're going to make a million 99 games and we're just everything is going to be 99. And then that's that's just been it. I mean, <laughs> well, I it I was mean, only a couple of months ago. Yeah, it was only a couple of months ago. I think there is still plenty of time for them because we did get Tetris 99. Let's we forget we got Mario 35 Mario RIP. And then shortly after we got uh, Pac-Man 99. So I totally think it is possible that there is... Uh, a variation on this, this idea in the works somewhere. Man, um, Mario nine or Mario uh, thirty five is so funny. Did we recognize at the time that we were living through like one of those moments in history, like uh, BS Zelda? Like, <laughs> no, we didn't. We didn't appreciate it that way. There was just too much going on. There was too much yeah. going on. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Hard to appreciate it uh, when everything else is going on. Finally. Dr. Goomba Tower is about to see their last patient as Dr. Mario World is shutting down November 1st. Uh, the official Dr. Mario World Twitter last week tweeted out a message letting them, everybody know that the last day to play would be October 31st. The game originally launched in 2019, never really got a lot of traction. Um, so seems like Dr. Daisy is destined to end up at the top of our definitive ranking of all the Dr. Mario World doctors. Yeah, I mean, here's another one where maybe we should uh, acknowledge that we are in a moment in history that this is a version of Dr. Mario that will no longer be playable in November, and that's it. Um, that's right. Know, it's just a weird footnote in our future conversations about what the Dr. Mario franchise was. 
I do think it's possible that Dr. Kamek is pulling their weight and uh, is shutting down Dr. Getting Dr. Mario World shut down because they don't want to live with the shame of being our worst ranked doctor um, in our definitive ranking. Right. Mark is, of course, referring to the list that we made a couple of years ago and then have been maintaining every time they've added new doctors. Um, I will miss the opportunity to continue to rank these doctors against each other, although everyone was going to fall before the might of Dr. Daisy, who is clearly and obviously the best one. Is Dr. Baby Wario our third <laughs> best doctor? He is, in fact, the third. The second best is Dr. Donkey Kong. And Dr. <laughs> yes, Four right. is Dr. Uh, Lakitu, and number five is Dr. Goomba Tower, just uh, beating out Dr. Rosalina at number six. I will stop reading there, but suffice it to say, if you, see, if you are able to see any of these doctors, you know that you're in good hands. All right, Mark, let's get out of the news. That is going to do it for this episode of Nintendo Cartridge Society. Remember, please rate, review, and follow us on Apple Podcasts. If you like the episode you can share it on facebook or twitter or wherever you share stuff we appreciate it when you do follow us on twitter i'm at patrick underscore ellers mark is at mke mitchell and the show is at nin cart society you can also check out a facebook page which is just nintendo cartridge society olivia duncan made our logo and our theme music is provided by ape betty you can get more of his music by going to ape or by listening right now For my co-host, Mark Mitchell, this is Patrick Ellery saying none of, no baby doctors except for baby Dr. Wario. It's just too good. Thank you for listening. My name is Will Himes, and I am a ghostwriter, meaning I write other people's books for them. And I have a podcast called I Will Write Your Book, which are recordings of my meetings with my eccentric clients, such as a woman blocked after one sentence of a children's book about her dogs, a romance novelist who dislikes sex, and a man proud of having sampled everything in his local grocery store. This podcast has been described as fully improvised, played by some of the best comedians on the planet Earth. Hey, that's pretty good. That's I Will Write Your Book on Campfire Media. Campfire.